Um, my PhD looked at the transnational experiences of migrants from different parts of the former Yugoslavia who are now live in Britain. But for the purpose of this presentation, I will be focusing on the experiences of migrants um, from Bosnia. So that's just a, an overview of um, the contents of the presentation. Um, regarding the contextual overview, um, because we've had quite a lot of presentations already today about transnationalism and diaspora in general, I won't focus so much on the literature, but I'll focus more on the um, empirical findings. So those were, broadly speaking, the main aims of the research project when I started. Um, my main aim, sort of generally speaking, was I wanted to explore how a migrant's relationship with their homeland changes when they move to a new country. Um, and I wanted to look at the different variables that could impact upon how a migrant's relationship um, is articulated. So I wanted to look at variables such as like the obvious ones, like nationality, ethnicity, um, country of origin. But I also explored variables such as gender, age, um, education background, um, the age when the migrant left the country of origin and where, at what point in the life cycle they were at that stage, what position in the family they held, and also um, the time of arrival in the UK and the context of reception, um, which welcomed or didn't welcome migrants when they arrived. So looking particularly at government policies and the change in policies as governments changed, and also how um, migration from particular countries uh, were presented in the media. Um, I'm not going to have time, obviously, to go through all of that today, um, but if you want to ask any questions later, that's, I'm happy to have a chat. So my theoretical approaches were um, twin approaches of transnationalism and diaspora. I used both theoretical approaches as I felt that neither one individually um, really captured the experiences of migrants as they were articulated to me. Um, in terms of the context of migration to Britain, um, there has been quite a long history of migration from the former Yugoslavia to Britain, um, starting around the First World War or just before that. Um, but having said that, there were certain parts of what was Yugoslavia um, that had greater patterns or ways of migration to the UK than others. So there were definite sort of um, hot spots of migration around First World War, um, during the Second World War of um, mainly uh, Serbs. Um, the Serbian royal family was exiled to Britain, given exile in London. And also, um, just after the Second World War, um, Mihailovic followers were given um, exile in London. And also, because of a labour shortage in Britain at the time, the British government targeted certain prisoner of war camps um, across Europe to fill a shortage of certain labour positions, especially in the north of England. Um, the economic migration out of Yugoslavia in the 1960s was not a particular feature of migration to Britain. There were other European states um, where gastarbeiters were mainly found, not so much in the UK. And then, of course, the conflicts in the 1990s and the conflicts in the 90s um, were a definite feature of more recent migration. Um, the restrictions of the immigration system uh, in Britain, which is some of which are particularly harsh and punitive, does make physical return um, quite difficult, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So the twin approaches then of transnationalism and diaspora um, that have been uh, characterized by Feist as awkward dance partners and the way that they're presented in the, in the literature. And you can see there how the focus in the literature on both of these concepts has exploded in the last 10 or 20 years and how the interest has, has grown. So the data on migration in general to the UK is very problematic, um, very highly politicized as well. Um, these are the available figures from the census in 1991 and 2001. 
um, which showed migration from the former Yugoslavia in general. It's very problematic data, so I um, wouldn't exactly claim that it's totally authoritative. Um, but what we're particularly interested in is the percentage increase between 91 and 2001 as a result of the conflict. And also the regional differences, partly as a result of the British government's dispersal policies and how they um, disperse those uh, seeking asylum when they arrive in the country. Um, this table, the first column, shows the more recent data from the census on country of birth and the numbers there. Um, and then what I also did was interviewed community representatives of the different community groups from former Yugoslavia and asked them to estimate the number of um, members of their communities in Britain. So the, the column in the middle shows what the estimates are. And then you can see the differences between the figures from country of birth and what the estimates are. Um, particularly significant difference in the number of Serbs estimated by Serbian community groups and those actually coming from Serbia, the state of Serbia. So some of that difference could be explained by the fact that the community groups are going to be talking about Serbs from all parts of the former Yugoslavia, not just Serbia in itself. But even if we take that into consideration, the, 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 the difference is really quite significant. Um, so just briefly then about the methods that I used during the course of the study. Um, I think it would be fair to say that it wasn't really a standard PhD uh, period of research in that I was a part-time student and I worked full-time throughout um, my studies as a researcher for a charity. I also had two children during the period of the PhD research, so I took two periods of maternity leave. So the PhD itself took a very long time to finish. Um, and because, partly, I think, because of the length of time that it took, um, and the fact that it wasn't a standard three years or four year study, I had the opportunity to go off on lots of tangents and travel down different paths that I might not otherwise have done if I had been a standard three year student. Um, so I tried to present the positives of that in that I feel as though I was able to give a more holistic uh, view of the different nuances of migration using all the different sources, particularly archive work. Um, there are some significant archives in London, um, particularly the Refugee Stories Archive at the Museum of London, which um, kind of maps the experiences of refugees over time. Um, and also the review of um, contemporary fiction written by migrants of, from the region who came to Britain and have articulated their experiences in the forms of um, poetry or fiction. Um, so that was a kind of a different path. Um, so the study was mainly qualitative, <clears throat> but having said that, I will present some figures as well. Um, so I wanted to look at the quantitative approach to economic and political transnationalisms um, from the different countries of origin. Um, I present some of the figures there. So you can see that migrants from um, Bosnia had particularly lower levels of um, participation in elections and also sort of economic interests, especially in terms of bank accounts and uh, property in the country of origin. Um, there were also low levels of economic transnationalisms um, as articulated by Slovenian migrants, but that can partly be explained by the fact that most of the Slovenian migrants in Britain are students and they're there temporarily and plan to return once they finish their studies. Um, one point of particular note was the number of migrants who affiliated or articulated their affiliation with Yugoslavia as you can see in the bottom row. So I asked questions about um, country of origin, nationality and ethnicity. And obviously it's not surprising that there were several migrants who said that the country of origin was Yugoslavia, given that they did come from Yugoslavia at different uh, periods, whether it was a socialist uh, Yugoslavia or Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. But what was interesting was that there were a small, there was a, um, a small group of migrants who stated that their country of origin was Yugoslavia, their ethnicity was Yugoslav, and also their nationality was Yugoslavian, which was an interesting finding, I thought, given that that was sort of physically not really a possibility anymore. Um, I also checked to see whether they had actually left the country, so whether they did have a passport that they could travel on, and they did have um, a valid passport that they were traveling on, so, but they still articulated their nationality as Yugoslavian. 
and those migrants were from either Sarajevo or from Belgrade. Um, so given then the sort of fairly low level or articulated low level of economic transnationalism as articulated by migrants from Bosnia, um, I kind of explored that a little bit more during the interviews and during the survey, um, and the main reasons that people expressed that they, they are sort of reluctant to engage economically with Bosnia were um, perceptions of corruption, um, and also the fact that people felt as though sometimes they didn't have the right to, um, to contribute anything um, because they, when they were no longer living there. Um, and that was particularly true of um, the right to vote And again, with um, politics, um, many of the community groups compared themselves with community groups from other parts of the former Yugoslavia. Um, there is a very strong political uh, Serb lobby in the UK. Um, the Serb community groups are very well established and they've been in the country for a lot longer, so they've had more time to establish community groups. There's a very well established Orthodox Church um, and all the culture that goes around that. Um, they have very strong uh, links with certain MPs and they have very well developed strategies for targeting those MPs. Um, the community groups are the Serbian, the Serb Society and the Serbian Council of Great Britain. The Serb Society is a, a registered charity and registered charities in Britain aren't allowed to engage in political um, activities. They're not supposed to be lobbying, they'll otherwise get their charitable status taken away from them. Um, and so they've got around that, or not got around that, but they solved that by establishing the political wing, which is the Serbian Council of Great Britain. Whereas some of the other groups um, who came more recently, including the Bosnians, are um, when they arrived, they were more about addressing sort of practical areas of need uh, rather than uh, lobbying politicians, although that is changing now. Um, so, moving a little bit to um, some of the context of transnational studies, and particularly, this was particularly relevant for migrants from Bosnia, many of whom came to the UK as refugees or seeking asylum. Um, much of the literature on uh, the refugee experience has tended to focus on the agency and empowerment of those coming as refugees, partly, I think, to counteract some of the negative um, immigration rhetoric. Um, but in doing that, I would say that some of the literature has actually uh, missed out on some of the practical considerations that were facing uh, refugees when they arrived in the country. Um, the fact that when, they, when people claim asylum, they have no right to work, so there is a very sort of difficult financial situation facing people for years. Um, the number of people who claimed asylum... Um, one person actually waited for 13 years for a decision on their status and the average um, wait was seven years. So it's a very, very long time to be waiting in limbo to have your life on hold while you wait for um, decisions to be made. So the resource-dependent transnationalism or capacity versus desire is very um, important when you look at particularly involuntary migrants um, who articulated some of the desperate situations that they were in when they first arrived. Um, particularly around the physical ability to phone home. There were no mobile phones at that time. Um, okay. um, so moving on then to some of the sort of socio-cultural transnationalisms. Um, some of the community groups have developed what I um, defined as cultural beacons around the country where they've um, got buildings appropriated and redecorated and refurbished to kind of represent um, buildings from home, from the homeland. Um, and this interview was with um, a man who um, has established a group singing Sevdalinka uh, along with his mother and um, he was talking about how he feels that music, he was trying to use his music to kind of bridge a gap between um, Bosnia and England. So we've seen then that most of the um, transnationalism in the economic and political arenas in terms of migrants from um, Bosnia, you know, the, the numbers look quite low. Um, but when we look at transnational articulations which are not quantitative in nature and can't be measured by the remittance count or by how often people vote, 
the more qualitative side of things and the, the depth of feeling and emotion that people still retain for their homeland is very strong. And the articulation of loss runs quite strongly through the Bosnian narrative. Um, so I've, I'm talking a little bit about different areas of loss. Um, the first one would be the, the, the life that people left behind, the fact that they had to sign over everything before they left, um, but also they had nothing really to replace that when they arrived, and some, like I said, for as long as 13 years. Um, some of the, the younger migrants who came, um, they had their education interrupted, and the loss of opportunity was very significant. Um, many people talked about the life that they would have had, and the education that they would have had, had they been given the opportunity. Um, what was particularly significant, uh, especially amongst older migrants and especially uh, amongst women, was the fact that they felt as though their uh, position in the family had been stolen from them. So they were looking forward to a life in retirement at home. They were looking forward to being the grandmother, the matriarch of the family, um, and they felt that that had been robbed from them. They were no longer had that opportunity. And what they were living out were kind of two lives, really the life in reality and the parallel life that they would have had, that interrupted trajectory that, that didn't happen. Um, one of the migrants talked about how when he first arrived, he um, didn't have enough money to phone home. So how it used to happen in phone boxes at that point was that you could, um, you could um, make a phone call, dial a number, and just hear the voice of the person on the other end of the phone before you actually had to put any money in. Um, and have a conversation. He didn't have any money to put in the phone box and have the conversation. So he used to have these really sad phone calls with his family back home where they knew that it was him on the phone because they just heard a sort of silence and then it would go dead. And that was his way of letting his family know that he was safe and, and he knew that they were okay and that was the only communication that they could have for, for several years. Um, so the, lo the loss of family life was really the most significant narrative running throughout all, all the interviews. Um, again, and the sort of interrupted trajectory and the, the, the sadness and the bitterness of the lives that could have been, that had been lost. So just in summary then, I would like to, um, much of the literature on transnationalism, especially um, within the US context, uh, discussing the experiences of migrants from Latin America to the US, focuses on quantitative transnationalism, they, um, Portes, Glickschiller, they all kind of impose certain conditions that have to be met before a migrant can be considered to be transnational. And some of those conditions are the, the number of times that people return home, the number of money that they send. But I would argue that that is quite um, an optimistic view of transnationalism, looking at the experiences of the confident, um, entrepreneur with lots of economic and social capital and what the literature often misses is the more nuanced experiences of those who might not remit, might not vote, might not have property anymore but do have a very emotional and deep um, connection to their homeland. Thank you.